Open your Bibles this morning, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. Last week we looked at this verse and we were looking at that word gift. And in this passage, spiritual gift, although we're, we talked about tongues last week, at, um, this spiritual gift also incorporates a several other things. Like we read in Ephesians chapter 1, and verse 3, that you have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ, which is your redemption, your salvation, your ultimate glorification, the imputed righteousness of Christ to your account, that when God looks at you today, if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, God is not looking at you. When He looks at you, He doesn't look at you. He sees you in Christ, and He sees you through Christ. And your righteousness, the righteousness that he sees, is definitely not your righteousness. It's the righteousness of Christ that he sees in you. And that's how he looks at you after you're in Christ. And that is a great blessing. Because if every one of us relied upon our own righteousness, we all would be doomed. Wouldn't we? Because we don't have any personal righteousness. God even told us in Isaiah chapter uh, 64, verse 4, that all our righteousness are as filthy rags. The very best that a human being can do, if you took the best of everything that anyone has ever done, the very best, think of the very best person you've ever heard of or you've never known or ever thought of in your life. Maybe your grandmother would come to mind as that example of kindness and love and generosity and compassion and forgiveness is all embodied in that great person that we know as our grandmother, right? Everybody has a great grandmother, right? And think of her and you wonder if she's ever sinned in her life because she was so good. Well, according to the Bible, all of the best that she's ever done is nothing but a filthy rag in the eyes of God. Because there is no righteousness in that. The flesh cannot do anything to please God. No matter how good it is, no matter how upstanding it is, no matter how, how upright it is, no matter how honest it is, your flesh, God hates your flesh. There is nothing good in human flesh. That's why it's going to die one day. It's going to die. But you, the person that lives inside of this body, this flesh is not you. This is not who you are. You, right now, are looking at me through the windows of your house that you live in. That's all you're doing right now. You live inside of here. But one day you're moving out of here. You're moving out of this body and you're getting a brand new house to live in. A glorified body. And that body God will love. But not this one. There's not, no righteousness here. So we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ. And so Paul comes to these Romans... And he says, I want to bring you a spiritual gift. Now, when this was written, we talk about understanding the conditions that were prevalent when a book was written in the Bible. We, we talk about knowing who it was written to, why it was written, what was the purpose for it. And during these days, around Acts chapter 20, 21, 22, when Paul wrote the book of Romans, spiritual gifts were in full operation. The gifts of 1 Corinthians were in full operation. And like we looked at last week, well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the last time we were together, we started looking at what the Bible had to say about tongues. 
because that was a gift that was obviously in full operation when Paul wrote this epistle. And we saw that when tongues were first spoken in Acts chapter 2, they were understood by those who spoke them. Okay? So the, the, the miracle of Acts chapter 2 was not only that they spoke in languages, but that the people who heard, heard their own language, their own, even their own dialect. Remember that? We talked about that. The dialect of the very country where the people were from. And this is very important because what we have in many churches today does not even remotely resemble what we see in that biblical pattern when tongues were first introduced into the world. And last week, we talked about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which turned to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 13, and we said that this passage deals with the, the transient, the temporary nature of these gifts, that they were only supposed to last for a while. They had a purpose, and they were only going to last until something happened. And we looked at that last week. And I just want to briefly touch on that. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 10, we had said that, but when that which is perfect is come, and that which is perfect is that which is complete, which is the Word of God. When the Word of God is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Then Paul says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And what he means in that verse is that during the early church, before they actually had a Bible sitting in front of them, Paul likens the ministry of the Word of God as we understood it like children understand things. We didn't have a full comprehension of it, but we didn't have the full Bible. So it was like a child, grow even the Bible was like a child growing up and eventually it became full grown and it became a full grown man. And today we have the completed word of God, the completed word of God. And that's the illustration that he uses. He uses the, the analogy of a child growing up representing the Bible, the Word of God. Verse 12, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then, when that which is complete is come, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Then I'll know the full revelation of the mind of God. When that which is complete is come, when that which is perfect, the Word of God, as we have it today, when that is come, then I'll know. I'll know God. I'll know the full revelation of the mind of God. I'll know everything that God wants me to know. I will know it all. I know everything that God wants me to know from this book. Nothing is left out. That's why there are no new revelations today. People stand in pulpits today, and they talk about, well, the Lord told me to tell you this. No, he did not. The Lord told you everything right here. It's complete. God's not telling you anything today through any other man that God gave, got a special revelation for you this morning. Yeah, he does. It's right here. His special revelation is right here. And it's complete. And there is no such thing as anyone this morning any, in America or anywhere in the world who is standing in a pulpit or anywhere else saying, I've got a new revelation from God for you. No. There are no new revelations from God. After... Jesus Christ finished revealing to the Apostle Paul the things that he wanted to reveal to Paul. When Jesus Christ stopped talking, Paul put his pen down. The revelation was complete. It was compiled. It was put into a book, and we have it today. And God stopped speaking. And he hasn't sp spoken 2,000 years since this has been in writing. Because that which is in part has been done away. Before this was here, that was necessary. Those gifts were necessary. So, there's a temporary nature. These were sign gifts, by the way, that we'll look at in 1 Corinthians chapter. They were called sign gifts. They were a sign. 
Signs followed the spoken word. As a matter of fact, keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 14 and just look with me at Mark, Mark chapter 16 very quickly. <clears throat> Mark chapter 16. Now look at, in Mark chapter 16, you have the, the Great Commission, as it's called, but it's the Great Commission to Israel, not our commission, as we looked at when we talked about the Ministry of Reconciliation a few weeks ago, which is our commission today. But in Mark 16, you have there in verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Let's look, look at verse 18 quickly, because if they shall take up serpents, you ever seen those programs on TV where they handle snakes and all that in their churches? Well, they don't, probably don't do that anymore because the people who used to do that, the guy ended up in jail and all kinds of things. So I don't know if they still do that. But they're following this as though it were written to you. This is not written to you. This is not written, the body of Christ doesn't exist here. You're in the Gospels. You're in time past here. The, God, the, God, the church doesn't even exist yet. Paul's not saved. Paul didn't get a revelation until Acts chapter 9. His re the revelation of the mystery. But it says, if they shall drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Oh, verse 17 is where it says they shall speak with new tongues. The last part of verse 17. They shall speak with new tongues. That's a sign. See, verse 17 says signs shall follow them. They shall speak with new tongues. Tongues were a sign. All right? They were a sign. Who are signs for? They're for Israel. We'll look at that verse in a few moments. But signs are for the Jew, not for the Gentile. Signs were never for us. They were always for the Jews. Now look at verse 20. And they went forth. You know where, when this is? That's Acts chapter 1 through 7. They went forth. After, actually, after Acts chapter 2, after the day of Pentecost. They went forth and preached everywhere. Notice this. The Lord working with them. That's a specific group of people, folks. You weren't there. The body of Christ wasn't there. He was working with them. And what was he doing? And confirming the word with signs. Notice he was confirming the word, not the written word. This didn't exist. He was confirming their words with signs. In other words, when these men spoke and when tongues were evident, tongues were a sign. And then when these men spoke, they spoke the word. And in order for people to know that this word was the word of God, in order for people to know that, they worked miracles. And people would look and say, well, look, listen to these men, listen to these men. Like in Acts chapter 3, where there's the man, he's sitting at the, the beautiful gate or the gate beautiful. He's been there for 40 years, and he's begging for alms. And Peter and John walk by on that day, and they see him there as they're going into the temple. And they're, he's begging, and they said to him, Silver and gold have we none, but such as we have give we unto you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. Well, think of the people who were, there was hundreds, maybe thousands of people there watching these two men. And probably some of them said, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, rise up and walk, yeah. Poof, oh. This guy rises up and walk. What was that? That was God confirming the word with signs following. That's what he was doing. That's what he said he would do. But God never confirms the written word. The written word is based on faith, not signs. For we walk by faith, not by sight. They walked by sight, 
not by faith. Israel had to see something. And if they didn't see something, they said, that ain't true. Remember, Jesus Christ walks through the door, walks through a door. Says, Thomas, it's me. I'm not going to believe till I touch. Remember that? I won't believe. Oh, Thomas, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are they who believe and have not seen. That's you and me. That's you and me. We believe and have not seen. You see? But it, when God confirmed the word, it was always the spoken word. The written word did not exist when Matthew, I mean when Mark chapter 16 was written. There was no written word. So in order for people to believe that it was God who was speaking through these people, he confirmed the word. I mean, Peter walking by and his shadow would heal people. As Peter was talking the word of God, his shadow, he spoke the word, signs followed. That's what Mark said, isn't it? That he would confirm the word with signs following. And those signs followed. Now, people who want to put themselves under this today are in a lot of trouble. Because people who want to put themselves under Mark 16, are you still there? In Mark 16, well, let me go back. In Mark 16, notice in verse 16. He that believeth, verse 16, 16, I mean Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, do you realize that according to that verse, what that just said is this. If you believe and you get baptized in water, you'll get saved. That's what, that's what it says there. If I didn't know about rightly dividing the word of God, if I didn't know that some things were written to Israel and some things were written to the body of Christ through the Apostle Paul, I would be confused here. Because this literally says, he that believeth and, and, see that word and? It's not just he that believeth, but he that believeth and is baptized. Now there are many groups today who will tell you, you can't be saved until you're baptized in water. They'll tell you that. Won't they? Because they're right there. They don't understand progressive revelation. You know, that would be like some guy reading in Exodus back here and saying, uh, you shall kill the, 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 the goat and sprinkle his blood on the altar. And he go, okay. <laughs> Boy, I got, so, I got something good for you folks today. Hey, bring that goat in here. Yeah, bring it right here. Pulls out this big old knife. That's what it says. I'm going to do it. Now, how stupid would that be? You know, there isn't a preacher who would do that today because somehow he knows that that doesn't belong to him. Yet he comes over here in Mark 16 where the program is still the same. The program has not changed. The dispensation of grace has not been introduced in the Gospels. And yet he'll come here and he'll say, you got to believe and be baptized to be saved. And he wouldn't have done that to Exodus and brought that over here, but he'll bring that. He'll bring this, Mark 16, into the body of Christ, though, and won't even think about it. Well, but here's what I wanted you to see in Mark 16. Verse 17 says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. Now, according to this, if you believe, signs are going to follow you. All right? Now, if I went around this room today and I asked, how many of you believe? How many? I want to see some hands. How many believe in the finished work of Calvary? Everybody in this room, everybody in this room believes. Okay. Now, according to this verse, you believe. When was the last time you laid hands on a paraplegic and he got out of his wheelchair? When was the last time that happened to you? Now, if it never happened to you, one of two things is obvious and evident. Number one, if that never happened to you, then you're not a believer. You're a hypocrite. You're a phony. 
if that never happened to you? Because according to this, and you believe the Bible, right? Well, according to this, signs are going to follow you. So if signs are not following you, you're not a believer. You're playing games with God. That's one scenario. The other scenario is this. You understand that that doesn't apply to you, that you do believe, and that signs don't follow the written word that you believed. See, you believed the gospel. You believed what's written in paper. You believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again from the dead according to the scriptures. You believed that, not because you saw it, but because you had it by faith. And now because you believed according to the pattern that Paul has given us in the Word of God, because you have believed that way, you don't have to worry about signs following you. Because the man who said, I am the apostle of the Gentiles, who said, I speak to you Gentiles, says that by faith you're saved. And he didn't say, and signs will follow you after that. Because the program changed when they stoned Stephen in Acts chapter 7. So signs were always to confirm that God was speaking through those people whom he sent back then, before they had the written word. Tongues were one of those signs. They were actually a sign from God that he was doing something. They were a miracle of language, unlike anything that had ever come before, or anything that has ever happened since. Now we'll break in where we left off last time, last time together. And remember that we made this point in Acts chapter 2 that the men who were listening understood. They understood the languages. Remember that? <clears throat> Do you remember that? Does anybody remember that? But in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, which turn to, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, something is happening. Something is happening. Notice verse 2. Well, let's read verse 1 and 2. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. Notice, for no man understandeth him. No man understandeth him. Do you see that? In other words, tongues that are being spoken here in 1 Corinthians, this is years after the day of Pentecost. At this juncture, when this is written, Paul's epistles are being written. His epistles are now starting to circulate amongst the local churches. Now in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, which I wonder how many of you took my challenge last week. I challenged people in here to read 1 Corinthians chapter 14 many times. And that today, after having read it, many times that I would show you things you had not seen. Did anybody remember that? Anybody read? Now remember this, before we get into this. This is the chapter that people who think they speak in tongues will go to to support their practice. This is the chapter, all right? And like I said last time we were together, when I started understanding that it wasn't me who was doing this babbling, which is what I was doing, and I read 1 Corinthians chapter 14 for two weeks, morning and night, on my knees. I wanted to know what it said. I wanted to understand it. And I saw things that in there that I realized that Paul was not encouraging this, he was now showing that it, had, it is fading away and it's, it was almost completely gone by now. So now, in, remember that in Acts chapter 2, every man heard in his own language and he understood. Now we've arrived to 1 Corinthians 14 and when someone speaks in tongue, Paul says, hey, nobody's understanding you. Huh? Nobody's understanding you anymore. 
I think a lot of people miss that. <clears throat> but now he's going to explain why this gift can no longer be used as it once was. He's going to explain that. So again, in verse 2, no man understandeth him, but verse 3, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Now we'll look at those three things very briefly, edification, exhortation, and comfort, but this is a biblical principle today that the purpose of ministry today is to edify the body of Christ. To edify means to build up. It means to strengthen. It's actually a word that comes from architecture. It has to do with a building. It has to do with an edifice. An edifice is a building that has been built strong to stand. Edify means to build up. To make somebody strong so they can stand. It's for the benefit of the body of Christ. That's what the ministry of the Word of God is. It's for the benefit of the body of Christ. And whenever anything in ministry is done for selfish reasons, or for personal ambition, or personal gain, it's always wrong. It's always wrong. And I submit to you that, that are, those are the characteristics that you see from your TV evangelists is personal ambition, personal gain, and selfish reasons. It's not for the growth of the body of Christ. It's not for the edification and the building up of the saints. That's not what they're about. It's a constant... It's a constant plea for help. They're the ones who need the help. They're on TV and they're always saying they need help. They need help. They need help. It's always them. I need help. But what are they doing for you? Nothing. They're just taken from you. They're fleecing you. They fleece the, they fleece the flock, so to speak. I used to go to a church where I know that the mentality of the pastors... Well, the mentality was this, okay? Okay, the, the pastor and the assistant pastor are there. Oh, here come the sheep. Oh, they're talking to themselves. I wonder what they're talking about. Oh, we got to stop that. Separate them. Oh, I heard they're having a Bible study at their home. We got to stop that. We can't let that happen. Because we want them to sit down, come in, sit down, shut up, listen to us. Give us your money, we'll take care of it, but you just sit there, and that was their whole mentality. You could see that's what the mentality was, because that's just how they were, you, and that was their obvious motivation. And anybody with any discernment will see that right away, that their, their concern was not for the body of Christ, but it was for themselves and for their ministry and I'm glad to say we don't do that. We don't even take an offering in this church. There's a basket right there. If people want to give, there it is. If you do, you do. If you don't, shame on you. But you should, but you, you know, we, don't, we don't push it under your nose and all that. But there are ministries, that's what they're about, personal gain. But your ministry, a ministry, must always have the best interest of the body of Christ at heart. Edifying the saints and building them up and teaching them the word of God and preparing them for the ministry. Look at verses 3 and 5, 3 to 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul says, But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. You see that? Somebody here, Paul say, hey, you speak in tongues? It's for yourself. You're doing it for you. It's not for the body of Christ. And the purpose of ministry is for the body of Christ. It's not for yourself. It's not about you. Verse 5, I would, he says, that you all spake with tongues, but Rather, that ye prophesied. 
For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Paul's purpose is I want the church edified. I want the body of Christ edified. It isn't difficult to see here that Paul's emphasis is on edification, building up the church, the body of Christ. That's the purpose of the ministry, so that the church will be edified. That's the main purpose, the sole reason for the ministry of the Word of God for the people of God, is so that they will be built up. There's no passage of Scripture. Keep your finger here. Open to Ephesians chapter 4. There's no passage of Scripture that relates this truth any clearer than Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. That's like four books beyond 1 Corinthians there. 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now notice what these gifts, these are gifts that God gave to the church. Why were they given? What is the purpose of their existence? Verse 12. For, Ephesians 4, 4, 11 and 12. They were given for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Everybody see that? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. I'm going to read 11 again. And he gave some apostles, those are gifts he gave to the church, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now there are no more apostles today, and there are no more prophets today, because those were temporary. They were apart. Remember that? Verse 12, he gave them, verse 12, for, because, to the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's why men stand in pulpits today and present the Word of God. It's for the perfecting of the saints. It's for completing the saints. It's for helping them to understand who they are in Christ. That's the most important thing. It's for the work of the ministry. It's to prepare them to do their own ministry. We talked about the ministry of reconciliation, which every member of the body of Christ has. Every person in the body of Christ has a place to serve, and it's the ministry of reconciliation. And then the work of the, they were given for the edifying, for the building up of the body of Christ. God's main concern is that the lives of those who are in Christ will be enriched by the ministry or from the ministry of those men who are in ministry, so to speak. Amen? Now, how long should God's ministers do what, they were, what they're supposed to do? Notice verse 13. Till, there's a time frame there. Until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, that's a complete man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What a tremendous responsibility the preacher has in his ministry. He must be certain that the Word of God is at the heart of his ministry for the purpose of building up the body of Christ, encouraging them, strengthening them, pointing them to Christ, helping them understand their position in Christ, who they are in Christ. That's the purpose of ministry. It's not, about, it's not about working people up into a frenzy and getting them all in the flesh and getting them all excited so they can open up their wallets and put more money in the basket. That's not what the church, the body of Christ, is about. And then verse 14 that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. 
but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. You're a joint in the body of Christ. Paul says you supply something to the whole body. That's why it's important, folks, for people to be together on Sunday morning. Everybody in here has something to contribute to somebody else. Whether it's a handshake, a hug, a good morning, I, I'm glad to see you. Whatever it is, you're supplying something to the body of Christ. Uh, notice, according to the effectual working, in the measure of every part, every part, that's you, every part, there's something that works within the joint of every part, maketh increase of the body, look, notice, unto the edifying of itself in love. Edifying is what the church the body of Christ and the ministry of the word are combined together to do and to accomplish. So as you can see, edifying is the central focus of 1 Corinthians 14 and Ephesians chapter 4, and that's what God is concerned about. God is concerned about you being built up. He's not concerned about you being worked up into an emotional frenzy where the world looks at you and goes, boy, you mean if I become a Christian, I got to be like that? I got to be jumping around on my pews? You've seen that before, right? It's not right. Think about that. That's confusion. God is not the author of confusion. And, and then in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul talks about exhortation. Paul told Timothy, I'll just read the verse in 2 Timothy 4.2, that preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all longsuffering and doctrine. Exhorting is connected with reproving. And also in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, which turn back to, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Edification, exhortation, and comfort. Those are principles of ministry, which tongues did not accomplish. Tongues did not produce this. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4, notice. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. You see that? You see what the emphasis he's putting there? See, you'll notice that the difference is that one gift has a benefit for the whole church, the body, which is the purpose for which the gift is given. It's to benefit the church. And one gift has the benefit of the person himself. And that's not the purpose for any gift that God gives to the body of Christ, or that he used to give to the body of Christ. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. That's chapter before 14. In verse 5, he's talking about love. And he says that love doth not behave itself unseemly. Notice, seeketh not her own. Seeketh not her own. Love doesn't seek her own. She seeks the welfare of others. She seeks the benefit of others in the same way that the gifts that God gave and that were in operation in these days were supposed to do. All right, now, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 again. We're going to look at some things. that are the emphasis of this chapter. Notice chapter 14, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Seek that ye may excel. Excel means... That's your, you know when you, you step on the throttle on your car, you're, you accelerate, 
you're excelling towards something, you excel to. Your purpose is to the edification of the church. Notice verse 17. Oh, for thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. Verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together? Every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. So the purpose of the gift is so that the whole church receives a blessing and is edified by the gift. Now go back to verse 2. 1 Corinthians verse 2, and let's learn why this gift wasn't profitable to the whole church at Corinth. All right, now we've, understood, we've established this for sure, that edification is the main purpose for the ministry of the Word of God, right? Okay, now let's look at why this gift was not profitable for the church. And again, this is the chapter that when I thought I spoke in tongues, this is where I went to support it. And the whole chapter is telling me, uh-uh, this isn't about promoting it. This chapter is telling you it's all done, which you'll see. You'll see clearly. It's all done. All right. Notice verse 2 again. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now why does no man understand him? Why doesn't any man understand him? Well, notice, keep your finger, notice verse 27 through 28. If any man speak, verse 27, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Now notice here's the rules of, rules of tongues in, that, in, in the early days. Was that when you spoke in tongues, at least two had to do it. And at the most three. Not just one. And not five or ten. There's a rule here. That's a rule. I've never seen this rule obeyed. In this day and age. I, it's always either usually one. Or a whole bunch. But it's never one or two, and at the most, three. Now, you can't possibly convince me, and you will never convince me, or you should never be convinced, that if someone violates this rule of tongues, that it's of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is not going to violate the Word of God. And if people can't even follow this, I mean, it can't be the Holy Spirit. Because you know what? Even if they didn't know this rule was there, if it was the Holy Spirit, he'd make sure they obeyed it. Even if they said that, even if they never read that, they got, they got this gift. I mean, I've seen people in little groups, five or six, and all of a sudden, Mrs. Jones, ra bra 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 bra, you know, verse twenty-eight. But if there be in no, in no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. If there be no interpreter. I've seen hundreds of times, I've seen people speak in tongues with no interpreter. With no interpreter. You see that? In verse, chapter 13, verse 1. You know, the reason, by the way, the reason, by the way, that people had to be, it had to be at least two, and at the most three, is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Paul said, this is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. That's why it's two or three. Because when one person does it, Another person has to do it to confirm. There has to be a confirmation. Let every word be confirmed. Oh, I'm sorry, that was 2 Corinthians 13, not 1st. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. 
That's why I don't want to go too fast. All right? Like I said, <laughs> according to uh, verse 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, at least two or three had, had to speak. I've been in churches at least five or ten. I've been in Bible studies where just one. I've never seen it fulfilled. But not only that, according to verse 27, two or three were to speak, and notice it says, that by course, which means in a row. Not one at the beginning, not one at the end. By course. From one to the other, and then the other. I'll tell you, you violate these things and then you, you what, 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 what just gets me is that somebody will violate this, but yet they will fight to you to the death to prove to you that they are speaking in tongues and they can't even follow the biblical pattern of how it's done. And then they want to tell me that what they're doing is of the Holy Spirit and they don't even know what, the, what it says. I'm telling you. You know, without being arrogant, whenever men violate the plain truth of Scripture, we must unapologetically reject what they are saying. You don't, refute, you don't, re, you don't receive that nonsense. Because if they can't go to the Bible and say, this is what the Bible says, and I'm going to obey the Bible... There's no place, there's no ground of fellowship there. I love you. I, you're probably saved, but you're doing things that are grieving the Holy Spirit. Now, let's not forget, we're making a link here between verse 27 and 28 with verse 2, okay? That no man understands in verse 2. He speaks to God who understands everything, but he's not speaking to anyone else because no one understands him. And the reason that no man understands him, notice, is found in verse 28. If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Now it's obvious here that the man with the gift of speaking a language that he never spoke before always knew if there was someone present who could interpret what he was saying. You know, for example... If all of a sudden, God gave me the gift to speak Italian. Because that's what they got. They spoke a language they'd never spoke before. And I, I imagine it would have gone, like, one of the things I wanted to do today with my PowerPoint, but we don't have the power cable, is show you the map of where Corinth was located. Corinth was located on an isthmus and it was surrounded by ocean on both sides. And people from the east coast of Palestine and Jerusalem and then all the way up Asia and all that, and they would sail and then to get to Rome or to Thessalonica and those places up there, they would, part, they would stop in Corinth and they would cross a little, they would unload their ship, cross a little isthmus by land. Gra get, grab another ship and then sail right up to Rome. They didn't have to sail all the way around. Corinth was located right on that isthmus where all of these sailors from all over the world would, and, you know, the ship trade routes in those days, that was the predominant way of trading and bringing goods like, tra today we use tractor trailers and trains. In those days, they used ships. I mean, we still use a lot of ships, but in those days, that's all there was. Well, all of these people from all parts of the world would land in Corinth. And they all spoke different languages. And when they got to the church at Corinth, oh man, all these people, and though, now Paul was all over here. He's establishing all these churches, man. And people are, they're getting saved and they're trusting Christ and they're on these ships. When they land, the first thing they want to do, hey, there are a local church around here? Yeah, the church, the local church at Corinth. And so they would go there. Now you've got people from all different parts of the world. They're all speaking different languages. And the pastor at Corinth and other of the people who were at Corinth, 
That's why this is spoken to the, the church at Corinth. These gifts were prevalent in the because God was communicating his word to all these different people through one person. So he would speak, let's say he got the gift and he spoke in Italian. There was an Italian guy there who could translate it to somebody who spoke in uh, Spanish or Aramaic. Or, and that's how it was happening in those days. But Paul says, hey, look, if there's no interpreter... If there's nobody who can interpret to another person what your language you're speaking, it wasn't gibberish, it was a literal language. If there's nobody there to interpret, don't do it. You see, today they think that if you're in a church where everybody speaks the same language that you're supposed to be speaking in tongues. Tongues had a reason. They had a purpose. They existed because they didn't have the written word. And God had to communicate to those people in a specific way. He had to communicate to them. That's how he did it. He did it with tongues. But if there's no interpreter, no one understands. Just like today. There are no interpreters for this gibberish that is passing as tongues in the churches today. There are no interpreters for that. It's not a language. You know, some people say, well, maybe it's a language from some tribe in Africa. Well then, my friend, you better move to that tribe in Africa because that's where they need you. Because they can't hear you from here. And why would God use that? See? Look at verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. But I'll tell you, you can rest assured, they were zealous of spiritual gifts in those days. <laughs> and they wanted everyone to know they had it, just like today. So Paul warns them to make certain that when they use them, that it's not for a show in the flesh, but it's so that the church will be edified. That's what Paul is talking about. But it's obvious that this gift was now losing its original purpose because now Paul writes to them, as we're about to see, to discourage them from even using this anymore. He's writing to discourage them and saying, put, put this aside. You'll see. Matter of fact, turn, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now let's look at verse 6. Paul says, Now brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. When he says, if I come unto you speaking in tongues, it's in the context of verse 2 where no one understands. Remember, verse 2 is what starts this chapter. No one understands. That's what he, okay. So if he says, hey, if I come to you speaking in tongues, <laughs> no one understands. What shall I profit you? Now, if you mark your Bibles, underline those words. What shall I profit you? Underline those words. Right? Put a line under what shall I profit you? Because this is the beginning of a series of several questions that Paul asks in reference to the gift of tongues that let you know, that let us know, that he is now discouraging this gift altogether. All right? What shall I profit you? Question number one. In other words, what good will my gift of tongues be to you if nobody understands? Is there any profit in that? You have to wonder why people speak what they call tongues today, okay? And then, notice verse... Um, Well, I want to do verse 6 a little more. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or doctrine? In verses 1 to 5, we have the test of edification. In other words, will the church be edified? That's what you have. If it doesn't, don't use it. But in the following verses that we're going to look at, we have the test of Intelligil intelligibility. In 
intelligibility of intelligence, of understanding. Okay, the speaker is expected to be able to understand what you're saying, is what Paul is going to show. So, notice he says, except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. These are all messages of real communication, languages that you could understand. Now, I'm kind of running out of time, but look at verse 31. You'll understand what the gift of prophesying was for. Verse 31 interprets... Verse 31, for ye may all prophesy one by one. Why? That all may learn. That all may learn. And all may be comforted. The gift of prophesying in those days was not like what some people think prophesying is today. You know, I got a word from the Lord, and thus saith the Lord to you, you did not repent when I called to you, and now I will pour down my wrath upon you. And, but if you turn from your ways, I will hear from heaven and pour you out a blessing. That's not prophesying. Prophecy was actually teaching the word of God. And since they didn't have a Bible, the people who were teaching it were getting it by divine revelation and passing it on. But it was in a language people could understand, and the people were learning. You don't learn if you don't understand. Now he's talking about, okay? And then notice in verse 7, even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped? Now he's using an analogy. He's using something that, has, that doesn't have a life giving sound to it, but it has a sound that you can recognize or a sound that you can understand. He goes on to say, even things without life giving sound. You following that? Verse 7, even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? Here's another negative question that you have to underline. How shall it be known? Underline that sentence. How shall it be known? In verse 6, it's what shall it profit you? In verse 7, how shall it be known? He's referring to an instrument. If a sound comes out of an instrument that you don't recognize, what good is that? So if a sound comes out of my mouth that you don't recognize... What good is that? For example, here's a harmonica. Okay? This is a harmonica. This thing produces sounds. Now, if I go like this. Did you understand anything? No. Of course not. Because that's in unintelligible. But if I do something like this. I messed up the last part there, but you, there, there was, you could hear, you, if you know the song, you knew the words. Because it actually gave you a, a sound that you could understand. Verse 8, for if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? Underline, who shall prepare himself to battle? That's another negative question. In verse 6, it's, what shall it profit you? In verse 7, how shall it be known? In verse 8, who shall prepare himself? You see the negative questions Paul is asking? In verse 9, so likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. Another negative question. How shall it be known? You see that? He likens tongues to speaking into the air. He uses another illustration in, uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, I believe, about beating in the air. You're not accomplishing anything. So he's emphasizing 
these things. In verse 6, what shall I profit you? In verse 7, how shall it be known? In verse 8, who shall prepare himself? In verse 9, how shall it be known? In verse 10, there are many, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. So, what Paul is saying basically is this. Instruments have a sound you can recognize. Voices have a sound you can recognize. But if you can't recognize the sound of the voice, and you can't recognize the sound of the instrument, what good is it? What good is it for you? You know, in other words, you know the sound of a bird because you recognize it's a bird. You re recognize the sound of a, of a lion because you recognize it's a lion. You recognize the sound of a, of a cat because you recognize. You recognize the sound of a dog. Every animal has its own sound. And what Paul is basically saying when he writes to these Corinthians is he say, hey, listen, I can understand a cow, but I can't understand you. That's what he's saying when he writes to these people. I understand a dog. I don't understand a thing you're saying anymore. People don't understand you anymore. And in this day, and those were real languages. In this day and age, nobody understands anything. Where is the prophet in that? In the body of Christ. Now I have to stop. And I was only halfway through my message. This thing stopped recording a long time ago. The light's flashing. <laughs> but, uh, well, you know, we'll continue this next week because there's still quite a bit to cover. But this is important, folks. You know, I spoke to you in English today. Aren't you thankful? You appreciate that. <laughs> I didn't try to speak to you in French. You wouldn't have understood that. And if I tried to speak in you in Spanish, all I can say is arroz con gandules, and that's it. And hermanos, and hermanas, and que pasa. Can't preach a message with that, you know. But uh, speaking in tongues, there's no such thing today. It had a purpose. It had a place. There was a plan for it. It was a part but it's gone. That's why today you're edified by the preaching of the Word of God and your heart is blessed and you feel right because you heard a message from the Word of God that spoke to your spirit, not to your flesh. And now you're encouraged in the Lord because you have a clearer understanding of where you are in Christ and what God is doing today, and how there's some things He did that had a reason. They don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore, because there's something better today. That which is perfect has come. It's here. This is what we use. Okay? Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful that we can spend time in the Word of God. We pray that the words of this message will forge themselves upon the tablets of our heart. We pray these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.